Welcome to Jarden Home Brands. This orientation serves to familiarize new employees with the EHS aspects and expectations of working at Jarden. Here's an outline of what we'd like to cover today. First, our EHS value and policies. Next, emergency response. I'm going to talk about minimizing workplace exposures. Then hazard communication, HAZCOM and GHS. After that, major JHB safety programs, and then some general rules, and we'll close out with a quiz. Jarden Home Brand success is built around supporting our values in everything that we do. These values include results, customer focus, environment, health and safety, integrity and respect, teamwork, and continuous improvement. This EHS value pledges us to operate in compliance with all laws and in setting higher internal standards where unacceptable risks are identified. Working for Jarden means making a commitment to performing your job safely to protect yourself and the people that you work with. It takes effort to keep safety foremost in your mind during every job task. In fact, injury statistics from the last 50 years indicate that most incidents are the result of unsafe actions. This includes taking shortcuts and failing to follow safety rules or job procedures. Some general policies have been put in place in order to protect our employees from painful and disabling injuries. One of these policies is the jewelry policy. The wearing of chains, necklaces, bracelets, dangling earrings beyond the earlobe, finger rings, and wrist watches is prohibited by any employee, contractor, or supplier that is required to enter a JHB facility area of production, warehouse, maintenance, yard, storage, cribs, or laboratories. That only leaves offices and parking lots. Guests and customers who are touring a facility will be requested to remove jewelry. If they do not comply, they will be restricted to designated safety aisles and kept away from equipment. Finger and hand injuries are often more severe when rings and watches are involved. When a ring catches during a fall, for example, serious muscle and bone damage can occur, including degloving, yanking all the skin off of your finger, or an amputation. A watch or a loose necklace make employees more vulnerable to injury from moving equipment and it increases the risk of electric arc burns when metal is put in close proximity to an exposed conductor. Where risks have not been engineered out of our processes, we have requirements in place to use personal protective equipment, or PPE. Based on a risk assessment, various items of PPE are required while performing certain tasks or while working in certain areas of the facility. This can include PPE to protect your eyes, your face, your hands, feet, your hearing, and your breathing. As a matter of policy, hearing protection and safety glasses, hearing protection and safety glasses are required in production and maintenance areas at all times. In addition, safety glasses are required when operating mobile equipment. That includes the warehouse. Safety-toed shoes, steel-toed shoes or boots are required everywhere except the offices and at all times when you're outside of a marked pedestrian walkway. Other PPE is required for specific jobs or specific tasks. EHS or your supervisor will explain these requirements to you when you are trained for these tasks. The green lines shown here are the designated pedestrian walkways that will be marked on the floors of the Fishers facility. There will be a lot of mobile equipment activity, so even when you're walking in the marked aisles, you have to keep an eye out for fork truck traffic. Multiple styles of hearing protection will be provided so that you can select one that you're most comfortable with. For disposable earplugs and other foam plugs, Follow these simple steps to maximize protection for your hearing. Roll the plug up and compress it. Lift your ear with one hand and insert the plug 
with the other hand. Hold it in place for three to five seconds while it expands to fit your ear. To remove, gently twist the plug and pull it out. Before you are assigned to a job for which a respirator may be required, and before you are allowed to voluntarily use a respirator, you must receive additional training, medical clearance, and fit testing on the particular respirator. Do not bring in your own respirator. The use of a dust mask, on the other hand, does not require a medical evaluation. However, before you are allowed to use a dust mask, you must review the information summarized on the next slide. The full document will be posted at locations where the dust masks are available. This is a publication from OSHA that talks about the dangers of uh, employees using respirators, particularly using respirators where they're not required under the standard. There's not enough dust in the air to require a respirator, but you choose to wear one anyway. Respirators are an effective method of protection against designated hazards when they're properly selected and worn. Respirator use is encouraged even when exposures are below the exposure limit to provide an additional level of comfort and protection for workers. However, if a respirator is used improperly or not kept clean, the respirator itself can become a hazard to the worker. Sometimes workers may wear respirators to avoid exposures to hazards even if the amount of the hazardous substance does not exceed the limits set by OSHA standards. If your employer provides respirators for your voluntary use, or if you provide your own dust mask, you need to take certain precautions to be sure that the respirator itself does not present a hazard. While we're talking about protecting your lungs, remember that smoking is allowed only in designated outdoor areas. Following our outline, we will now move on to emergency response procedures. In the event of a fire alarm, exit through the closest safe exit and move to designated gathering points. The production and warehouse gathering points are in the grassy areas to the south of the facility. If you happen to be in the north office area when a fire alarm is sounded, exit to the northeast parking lot. This is a picture of the gathering points relative to the building. At the bottom left, is the gathering point for the warehouse area, bottom right is the gathering point for the production facility, and at the top right is the gathering point in the parking lot between the building and East 121 Street. If there's a tornado, you will be instructed to move to interior areas away from windows. Tornado watch means the conditions are right for a tornado to develop. In the event that a tornado watch is issued by the National Weather Service, employees will be advised to be ready to quickly move to shelter areas. We won't go yet. You will be advised to quickly be ready to go. A tornado warning, on the other hand, means that a tornado has actually been sighted. In the event of a tornado warning, employees will be advised to move quickly and calmly to zone refuge areas. The most reinforced structures available to us are identified block buildings. Remain on the first floor and participate in a head count so we can make sure that everybody's taken care of. One risk issue that we need to cover is one that's caused by people violence in the workplace. It is Jardin Corporation's policy that we expressly prohibit and will not condone any acts or threats of violence against Jardin's employees or visitors at any time on or off of Jardin's property. To enforce this policy, Jardin is committed to the following. Take prompt action against any employee or visitor who engages in threatening behavior or acts of violence. Prohibit employees or visitors from bringing firearms onto Jardin's premises and 
by establishing viable security measures. To make this system work, Jarden puts some responsibility on all employees. To preserve facility security, employees who are currently involved in a violent relationship outside of the workplace, or who are in receipt of an order of protection, or who just need time off from work in connection with workplace or domestic violence, should notify their local human resources representative. We will do everything possible to keep the information confidential, but we cannot defend against what we don't know about. In addition to these victims of domestic violence, all employees have a duty to warn their supervisors and the Human Resources Department of any suspicious workplace activity or situations or incidents that they are aware of that appear to be problematic. Duty to warn. It includes, for example, threats or actual acts of violence, aggressive behavior, offensive acts, and threatening or offensive remarks. Employee reports made pursuant to this policy will be held in confidence to the maximum extent possible. And Jarden will not tolerate any form of retaliation against an employee for making a good faith report under this policy. To provide some context for how we define workplace violence, these are common categories for types of violence in the workplace. Type 1 is criminal intent, for example, robbery. Type 2 is violence by customers. This is often cited in violence against nurses or cab drivers, cab drivers and bartenders. Type 3 is violence against co-workers. And type 4 is personal, for example, domestic violence that spills over into the workplace. As an office environment, the north end of the building is going to be the most concerned about types 3 and 4. To minimize the risks, of these types of workplace violence, the following are examples of the types of countermeasures that are already in place. The facilities in Fishers are secured with swipe cards for employee access. Do not allow others to use your access device and promptly report lost or stolen access devices. Also, don't let someone that you don't know come through the door on your swipe. If necessary, ask them to use the phone in the North Visitor Lobby and ask them to call for someone to come and escort them. Second, pre-hire screening. In addition to establishing a zero tolerance policy for workplace violence by or against employees, candidates for employment are subject to pre-hire screening process that includes criminal background checks and checking references. Third, employee awareness training. To ensure that all employees understand this policy, routine training will be conducted for employee awareness of the workplace violence prevention programs. This training will include policy explanation, employee responsibilities, danger signs, and threat response actions. We're not trying to make you into a certified psychologist, but we ask you to be aware of potential warning signs. The concept of someone simply snapping and committing a violent act with no advance warning is not true. Instead, the person may progress through a continuum that ranges from unusual behavior and acting out, to verbal assault and harassment, to threatening behavior and even physical assault before a deadly encounter occurs. While none of these warning signs may be a strong indicator by itself of potential workplace violence, you should be aware of sudden and dramatic changes in behavior of the people that you work with every day. The following warning signs might indicate that a worker is experiencing difficulties that could eventually lead to a violent encounter. Increased absenteeism or tardiness. This can be a sign of a change in the demonstration of a fundamental personal responsibility. Or an employee becomes vocal about believing that nothing is his fault he might voice extreme frustration and even a fear of persecution. Or they might suddenly develop an interest in firearms. Or they'll suddenly have a detrimental change in appearance. Okay, that particular guy's wife might have just had a baby and he's busting his butt to get to work. But if not, 
that could be a sign of a sudden personality shift. Sometimes, most obvious, is the onset of sudden mood swings. If you're concerned, please contact HR. Your concerns will be kept confidential to the extent possible. You don't want to be the person, after the fact, that's kicking themselves for not saying something when you felt that someone was going off the rails. Finally, in the unlikely event that all else fails and gunfire is heard in the offices, there are a few recommended actions. The Department of Homeland Security is distributing this message. Run. Hide. Fight. Run is pretty simple. If you get the opportunity, get out. There are at least 14 door exits and dozens of dock doors in these buildings. Stay out of sight. Get away from the building. Call 911 when it's safe to do so. If you can't get out, hide. Get into a conference room or an office, kill the lights, and lock the door. This is a good time to silence your cell phone. Position yourself behind something heavy and quietly call 911. The police will respond in force, so wait until you hear the all clear from the police. Follow their instructions. Don't stop for backpacks and briefcases or computer bags and exit the building with your hands visible. You've all seen this on TV. Remember, the police do not know who you are. They will be trying to determine if there's more than one bad guy. So don't do anything that could be interpreted as threatening. By the time the police are in the building, medical first responders will be close behind. It's not your job to render assistance to anyone that you think may be hurt in the building. Keep moving. Follow directions from the police. Depending on how long the situation has been developing, there will be onlookers or media representatives outside. At this point, we will all be very emotional, so remember, we do not talk to them. Communications with the public and the media about an incident like this will be directed through authorized Jardin spokesmen. It is not okay to talk to the press. The absolute last resort here is fight. This is very dangerous. It's a low percentage move. Only if you are completely out of options and your life is in imminent danger does DHS consider attacking the shooter. And by attack, they mean trying to quickly and violently incapacitate him. Next, we'll discuss a few situations that can lead to serious injuries if you don't know how to deal with them. The first is bloodborne pathogens. If you're in a janitorial job or on a first aid team, you could be exposed to blood or other body fluids. If you are in a position where this exposure is a possibility, you will receive additional training, like first aid, and you will be offered a vaccination for hepatitis B. For anyone else that is not a janitor, is not on a first aid team, has not had additional training, has not had the hepatitis B vaccine, treat all body fluids as if they are infected. Use gloves, masks, glasses, and any other protective gear that you can if you must come in contact with an injured person. Promptly, after contact, carefully remove the PPE, thoroughly wash your hands, and expose skin with soap and water. Next is ergonomics. Most back injuries result from improper lifting such as stretching your back muscles or twisting your back while you're trying to lift an object. Exercise and stretch before lifting. The discs in your back ask as act as a shock absorber between the vertebrae and keep the nerves from being pinched. The basic lifting technique shown here keeps the discs in the proper alignment between the bones. When you bend your back, the discs can be damaged. So bend your knees, not your back. When you lift anything, Get a good grip, bend your knees, use your leg muscles to lift the load. Don't stretch, don't get your arms away from your body while you're lifting. 
This can cause painful muscle tears that can take a long time to heal. Never twist when lifting. This means if you have to, you can move your feet to turn to the side to put the box down, but don't plant your feet and twist your back while you're holding that box. This is extremely dangerous. Only you can prevent back injuries. Think about safety when you lift anything. An issue that can come up in warmer weather is heat stress. When we get closer to hot weather, additional information will be provided to employees to review the typical symptoms to be on the lookout for in yourself and in the people that you work with. If you feel a problem coming on, let your supervisor know and keep hydrated by drinking plenty of liquids. Heat index is determined by a combination of the outside temperature and the local humidity. When the heat index reaches certain levels, supervisors are responsible for adjusting workloads, increasing breaks for hydration, and watching for symptoms of heat stress. Help them keep an eye on yourself. Alright, in our outline, the next issue that we have to talk about is hazard communications. Um, and a, a discussion of the new labeling and safety data sheets that are beginning to be made available to identify the hazards of materials that we use in the workplace. The previous HAZCOM or Hazard Communication Standards from OSHA were referred to as a right to know program. The regulatory changes are being rolled out now called HAZCOM 2012 and they are inden intended to standardize and simplify hazard communication and to enhance employee understanding. So HAZCOM is a right to know regulation and now it will also be a right to understand regulation. OSHA's HAZCOM 2012 rule updates will align the United States requirements with a globally harmonized system, or GHS, that is currently in use in over 65 countries. The international standards ensure that regardless of where a chemical originates, employees will recognize the potential dangers of handling the material and understand precautions required to protect themselves against the materials. Here are some changes to be looking for. Material Safety Data Sheets, or MSDS, will be converted to a standardized format called a Safety Data Sheet, or an SDS. MSDS will become SDS. Information on Jarden products is required to be converted to SDS format by June 2015. Some of our customers are requesting this information now, so you're going to start seeing our MSDS forms turning into these SDS forms. Hazard labels on Jarden products will be required to change in 2016. Workplace labeling and written hazard communication program updates are also due in 2016. So we've got a little while to work on it, but it's starting now. Affected employees must receive initial training regarding the appearance of the new GHS material hazard labels and how to find and use information in the new safety data sheet format. The objectives for this section include reviewing the six classes of chemical hazards so that you'll know what they're talking about when they get reeled off in one of these labels also reviewing components of the standardized hazard labels and the introduction of pictograms, pictures, to quickly communicate the hazards. And last, a discussion of the information found in the standardized 16 section safety data sheet. We'll start with a view of the six classes of hazards. Dangers presented by chemicals and materials in the workplace can be assigned to one of six broad classes. The first, physical hazards. This includes explosives, flammables, and extreme temperatures. 
They will physically damage you. The second class are health hazards. This class includes chemicals that can damage specific organs or act as poisons or acids. The third hazard class are simple asphyxiants. These are materials that de deprive the body of oxygen, like a scavenger, such as carbon monoxide or nitrogen in a confined space. The fourth class is combustible dust. Any finely divided solid that can burn or explode is a combustible dust. Examples include sawdust, medical sha metal shavings, plastic powders, and, and even sugar or cotton. Next, number five are the pyrophorics, which are materials that can spontaneously combust when exposed to air, things like sodium and phosphorus. And finally, class six is a catch-all for hazards not otherwise classified. Adverse physical effects that do not meet the criteria of any of the other classes get lumped into class 6. Hazards not otherwise classified. Now for a review of the labels and the pictograms. When handling a material can expose employees to a physical or health hazard, the container must be labeled to identify the hazard. HASCOM 2012 GHS updates include standardized requirements for label contents and it introduces a set of pictograms or pictures or symbols that visually represent the hazards. Under the globally harmonized system, hazard labels will be required to provide a lot of information including these components. It has to start out with a product identifier that's the name of the product that matches up with the safety data sheet. Next will be a signal word. If it's a hazardous material, it's either going to be danger or warning. Danger means there's more threat from this material than warning. Next will be a hazard statement. What is the danger or the warning? It'll be a description of the hazards. Next will be the pictograms, one or more symbols representing specific hazards. After that will be a precautionary statement. They've told you it's dangerous, they've told you what the hazards are, they got some pictures to help you figure out what the hazards are, now they're going to give you a precautionary statement that is information explaining how to safely handle the material. And then we're going to have the name and address and telephone number of the chemical manufacturer or the importer or some other responsible party meaning someone who can provide additional information on the hazardous chemical and appropriate emergency procedures if necessary. Labels are going to look like this. At the top is a product identifier. In this case it's ZZZ red paint. Then comes the signal word danger. Then comes the hazard statement. What is the danger? The danger may damage fertility or the unborn child. It's highly flammable liquid and vapor. It contains lead, pigments, and cellosolve acetate. Next is going to be the pictograms, pictures. And these are standardized. We'll talk about there's nine of them. They'll always have a red uh, diamond around them with black picture in the middle. After that comes the precautionary statements keep away from heat. And then below that will be the responsible party. They can throw in first aid here if there's room for it and it doesn't uh, disagree with any of the information that's been reported previously. And then again at the bottom will be the responsible party. Labels and SDSs will include one or more of the nine pictograms shown here. We're going to take a closer look at all of them so you don't have to get any closer to the screen. The first one, skull and crossbones. This is generally the most serious health hazards. A single threshold exposure can be fatal. 
We're talking about something that you get a good whiff of it and it kills you. Acute toxicity. Skull and crossbones. It figures. Next in line for serious health hazards that do not meet the acute toxicity threshold of the skull and crossbones level, this picture will be used. It's supposed to be um, a silhouette of a person with a star or an explosion in their chest. Examples of health, health hazards represented here include carcinogens, chemicals that can cause cancer, reproductive toxins, and then target organ toxicity hazards, such as a material that can cause liver damage. So, skull and crossbones, then the, the silhouette with the explosion star in its chest. Next, this pictogram signifies a corrosive, a material with hazards generally limit, limited to damage on contact, pouring acid on your hand, getting lie on your arm. While the health hazard is still significant, the effect of corrosives is generally less than that of skull and crossbones or the person with the star in his chest. The graphic is similar to the current Department of Transportation corrosive label that shows a liquid damaging skin and metal. Examples again include strong acids and bases. One more step down on the severity level is the exclamation point. The effects for a chemical in this category are usually characterized as an irritant or a sensitizer. Also included in this group are materials with narcotic effects, things that dull the senses and can put you to sleep. It just means a generic lookout. The first four pictograms that we ran through indicate the severity of effects and only one of them will be used on the label. The remaining five symbols represent specific hazards and may be used in combination with the other pictograms. This one the flame indicates a potential for fire, such as a flammable liquid or a solid or a material that emits a flammable gas. This symbol, the flame over a circle with an O below the flame, is for oxidizers, which can increase the danger of a fire when they are near combustible materials. Examples of this include uh, nitric acid, hydrogen peroxide, and, and even chlorine. So a flame with an O is an oxidizer. That is not a rolling pin, that is a gas cylinder, and it represents a pressurized gas. You may see it in combination with a symbol for flammable or a health hazard. It's just under pressure. Doesn't mean the gas itself is necessarily dangerous. This pictogram denotes a material capable of exploding. And finally, this last symbol, a dead fish by a dead tree, represents an environmental hazard such as aquatic toxicity. You might see this on the SDS in the ecological section, but it is not an OSHA requirement. In addition to the nine pictures, Hazard labels will also include a signal word, which is either danger, which is more hazardous, or warning, which is less hazardous. The GHS label components that we have been discussing will be mandatory marking for hazardous materials manufactured or distributed by a company. They'll go on our packaging when we sell a product these will also start to show up on retail packaging and on shipping containers. Markings on a container in the workplace, a secondary container, the little bucket that you carry some of the solvent with from the drum. Uh, we, we will have a little more flexibility on those labels as long as the hazards are communicated. We will continue 
to use our current labeling systems for secondary containers in the workplace. As employees become more familiar with the GHS labeling, our internal labeling requirements will be updated. The final HASCOM 2012 item that we need to review today is the new standardized format for safety data sheets. So bear with me, there are 16 of them and I'll tell you what they are. There will be 16 standardized sections so that employees will know exactly where to look for a particular piece of information, like PPE or disposal requirements. The SDS won't have significantly different information than the current MSDS, but they will be in a uniform format, in a uniform location. We will quickly review the required sections and the type of information that will be found there. Section 1 will include information identifying the material and the manufacturer. Section 2 is for hazard identification. We'll see an example of that in a minute third section contains information about ingredients or the composition of the material. This is an example of the information provided in section 2 for acetone. It includes the pictograms, signal word, hazard, and precaution statements. All this stuff has to get jammed onto the label. Section 4 is where you go for first aid measures. If you got it on your hand, in your eyes, on your clothes, this is, this is where you go looking for countermeasures and treatment options. Section 5 talks about extinguishing techniques if the material catches on fire. Section 6 lines out emergency procedures for responding to a spill. Section 7 is where you will find instructions for handling and storage. Incompatible materials will be identified here. Don't sit this box next to that box. The eighth section is for information relative to exposure controls and personal protection. This is where you go to find out if you should be asking about the respirator program or if you have to wear goggles or a special kind of impervious gloves, recommended PPE. This is an example of uh, the information required in section eight. Uh, procedures and PPE to protect against identified hazards that were discussed earlier in the SDS. Section 9 is reserved for physical and chemical properties. Technical specifications like the flash point, flash point, viscosity, and density will be found here. Section 10 is for information about the stability of the material. If this is a strike anywhere match, it'll tell you not to open them up and throw them on the floor because they can catch on fire. Section 11 is for toxicological information. Data displayed here tells you what can happen with overexposure. It'll tell you what is the exposure looks like, what the target organs are, what the response is, and what the symptoms are. Sections 12 to 15 contain information relative to environmental effects and EPA requirements. We're talking about OSHA requirements, so I'm not even going to cover those right now. This is also the area where the Department of Transportation requirements can be listed. For information for other regulatory programs can also be found here. The last section, section 16, is for other information that the manufacturer feels is important to using the material. If it's not listed anywhere else in the SDS, this section will also include the revision date of the safety data sheet so you can tell how old it is and how, how new the information might be. These requirements will be phased in over the next two years. You will be periodically updated throughout the transition. The first changes that you will see are new labels and updated safety data sheets. Okay, we're done with HASCOM. Have to talk a little bit about the major safety programs. The next few slides contain an introduction to the requirements for some of our major safety programs. This is intended to be an awareness level discussion. 
before you are assigned to tasks that involve these programs, you will receive additional training. First is confined space. A confined space is typically an area that's large enough to enter, like a tank, bunkers, bag houses, large equipment, and silos. As such, it's possible to develop a dangerous condition inside, like a toxic or oxygen deficient atmosphere, or even an engulf engulfment potential. Confined spaces must be labeled. Until you have additional training and are issued a permit to enter, and you know what you're doing, your only responsibility for these areas is to stay out. Next is fall protection. Many significant injuries are the result of different level falls. The fall protection program includes general principles like don't use chairs and boxes and makeshift platforms to reach high places. Use a ladder designed for that purpose. Inspect the ladder before every use and never use an effective ladder. Don't stand on top of the top two steps on a step ladder. Extension ladders must rise at least three feet above the level that you're trying to climb to. And until the extension ladder is tied off at the top, somebody else has to be holding the bottom of the ladder while you climb up or climb down. There is an additional brief training program including more detail on ladder safety. Slips and falls injure more people than any other type of accident. So pay attention to hazards such as wet or slippery floors and torn carpet, damaged tile. Eliminate hazards when they're detected. Always hold on to handrails when you're walking up or down stairs. Fall protection is required. It's mandatory when you are working on unprotected heights that are four feet above the floor next to them. Fall protection is required when you're working at unprotected heights above four feet. Additional training is required before using fall protection harnesses and lanyards. A little bit about electrical safety. Please report damaged switches and plugs and cords, receptacles, tools, and other electrical hazards to your supervisor immediately. If the cord that you are using has a third prong, or it's supposed to have a third prong, it must not be broken off. Once that grounding plug is, is broken off, the extension cord should be cut up in little short pieces and thrown away. This provides the proper grounding for a cord or a tool that's plugged into it. If the data plate on the tool doesn't say that the equipment is double insulated, its plug must also have the ground prong for safe use. Unless you are certified by Jarden Home Brands as an electrically qualified employee, you are not allowed to open electrical panels. Work on any system over 200 volts requires an electrician or an electrically qualified employee. If you have not had extensive training in electrical systems and protecting yourself from live voltage, you are not qualified to open those panels and work in them, even to flip a breaker. Over 200 volts, get an electrician. Lockout Tagout is another important safety program. Lockout Tagout uses documented machine specific procedures to de energize equipment before removing guarding in order to perform servicing and maintenance. Until you have received additional training and have been designated as an authorized employee and issued locks and tested on machine specific lockout tagout procedures, you are not authorized. And your only interaction with the lockout tagout program is to recognize when equipment, equipment has been locked out and to know that you are prohibited from attempting to start up the equipment or to remove the locks. 
So when you see these tags and these locks, you know to stay away from that equipment. That equipment is being locked out to protect someone else's life. Lockout, tagout locks and tags are standardized across the facility for easy recognition and they will include information on the lock or the tag uh, to identify the person, a single uniquely identified person that put that lock there. Everybody that's working on that piece of equipment is going to have their own lock and their own tag. Only, only authorized employees can place locks and tags on equipment. If the employee placing the lock puts it on, he is the only person that's authorized to remove it. Okay, forklifts. Before you will be allowed to operate any type of mobile equipment, you must be trained and licensed at this facility. Regardless of your past experience or familiarity with the equipment, you must be certified personally at this facility for the specific equipment that you will be using before you will be allowed to operate any mobile equipment without close supervision. And, and a little bit of information about machine guarding. Most equipment has mechanical parts that require guarding. These guards must always be in place while the equipment is in operation. As an operator, you must make sure that all guards are in place and bolted down or interlocked before operating the equipment. That's your responsibility to keep yourself and your co-workers safe. You should know the location of all emergency stop buttons in your area, as well as any machine-specific lockout procedures and any equipment they affect. Never place your hands or any other part of your body into operating equipment, into an area where unexpected energization can hurt you. It's your responsibility to make sure that the area is clear before turning on any equipment. Also, don't leave running equipment unattended or attempt to perform maintenance on any machine while it is in motion. Keep your work area clean. Don't let debris clutter your work area. And should tools or equipment become unsafe to use, notify your supervisor. Almost done. We're down to general rules. The last topic that we'll cover in this orientation is a review of some of the general environmental health and safety rules that are in place to protect you, your fellow employees, and the process equipment. Air guns. Care must be taken when using compressed air guns. Air guns must never be directed at yourself and never directed at others it is prohibited to use compressed air to blow dust off of your clothing or off of a person's skin. It is prohibited to use compressed air to blow dust off of your clothing or skin. Prior to using any air gun, verify that the pressure reducing tip is in place and is not blocked. On most of the air guns this will be um, a small hole drilled in the side of the tip that will limit the pressure if it gets dead-ended somewhere. Make sure those tips are on and they're not damaged and they're not blocked. Incident reporting. If you are injured on the job, if you are injured, you must report the injury to your supervisor immediately. Even if you don't think you need medical treatment, report all accidents. Even report injury-free events or near misses and injuries to your supervisor when they occur. These injuries and events will be uh, investigated to determine what the root cause was that, 
that made them happen in the first place and then we can take corrective action to eliminate that root cause so that nobody else has to get hurt under the same conditions. So if you're injured, report your injury immediately to your supervisor. You will be asked to provide information to complete a first report of incident, FROI, within 24 hours of an injury. And your participation will be expected for an incident investigation and development of root cause corrective actions within 72 hours, three days, of the incident. So the first report of incident, immediately report to your supervisor within 24 hours. You help them put this one form together, the first report of incident. You will also be expected to help with the incident investigation that is due three days after the incident. We talked about this a little bit with the workplace violence uh, material, but communication with the media, TVs, newspapers, radio, YouTube, blogs, anything. In the event of an incident, injury, fire, major damage to a building, members of the media may attempt to get a statement or an interview from you during or following an emergency situation. They'll be hanging around in the parking lot looking for somebody put your face on TV. In this case you don't want to do that. Direct um, all inquiries to the plant manager. Media response by anyone else is strictly against company policy. Violations are subject to disciplinary action up to and including termination. It is not okay to talk to the media after an incident. A couple of general rules. They've kind of been in there uh, in the earlier part of the presentation. No running. There's no reason to run. Even if the place is on fire, walk quickly, don't run. No horseplay. It, you know, tell jokes, smile, talk nice to people, but no horseplay. Steel-toed safety shoes are required at all times while on the plant floor. No watches, rings, or jewelry are to be worn on the head floor, on the plant floor, on the head floor. And last, no headphones. Like your tunes, listen to them in your car, listen to them at home. Don't wear headphones on the floor. You can't hear people talking to you. You can't hear people warning you. You can't hear a fork truck coming up behind you. And some, uh, some cardinal rules from Jarden Home Brands. An employee who willfully commits any of the following will face disciplinary action up to and including termination. These are the serious ones. If you bypass any safety interlock, or a lockout tagout device. If you jump around an interlock so that you can open the door without shutting a piece of equipment down. If you take somebody else's lock off, you'll be fired. Second, failing to follow a lockout tagout procedure. Doing it only partially because you think that's all that's necessary the procedure is written, the procedure must be followed. You can talk to your supervisor or EHS if you've got a, a suggestion for making it more simple. It'll be evaluated and if it's a good idea we'll put it in there. We want to make interlock or lockout tagout as little disruption to manufacturing as possible. But while that procedure is there, follow it. Never enter a confined space without a permit. If it says confined space, your job is to keep out. Also, if you're more than four feet above an unprotected edge, you have to be using fall protection equipment. And last, uh, don't smoke in non-designated areas. Now it's time to take a test. It will be uh, a short test. 
to cover some of the information that we've tried to highlight here in the presentation. So, good luck.